Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar Vargo with Vargo on why Vargo metering. Um, no, we've just started, and um, we'll just give a minute or two um, to allow some people more time to join. Hello again, my name is Yin, I'm the Marketing Executive at Rexel. Thank you once again for joining our webinar with Vargo on why Vargo metering. Our guest today is Andy Turtle, Product Manager at Vargo. Please note that this is a recorded webinar and it will be available to watch on demand on the Rexel website. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A box and we will answer them at the very end. Now passing the time over to Randy. Thank you very much, Yim. So welcome to the webinar, Why Vargo Metering. As Yin's explained, I'm the product manager here at Vargo. So what we hope to um, show you and explain over the next 30 minutes is how metering can help with saving energy costs, compliance with legislation, tendering for projects, um, in the MID capacity for billing purposes, and also how it, uh, it interacts with things like um, businesses' own sustainability goals and corporate social responsibility. And as an example of an MID meter, we'll be featuring our own 879 series and uh, extensive information around how they can be used. As Yin's explained, it's a 30 minute presentation. Um, please. Um, pop any questions in on the uh, chat or keep them back for we have a 15 minute Q&A session at the end. So the contents will follow that introduction around why we measure energy, how building regulations and other economic drivers um, are influencing the high demand for metering, types of meters, indeed including the MID type, our own meter as an example of how these can be implemented and the sort of features and, and functions that a meter offers a customer, and uh, some application examples showing how meters are used by customers. And some port documents or links are also included so you can see where further reading and further information can be found. Uh, we'll have the 30 minute Q&A session to follow. So why metering? Well, and why measure energy? And I guess we're all aware of this as we all have our own electric bills to pay. Um, the important thing is that by knowing what our energy use is, we can of course be more influencing how we actually use it and indeed how we can perhaps make measures and reduce energy use. And there's lots of focuses around this, of course, high energy costs, they're increasing, although fortunately they seem to have stabilized somewhat now, but any volatility, we can see energy costs increasing. And of course, but for businesses, it's a huge expense that they need to manage and indeed reduce. Other drivers such as the net zero targets are also influencing this behavior. Using a meter or adding additional metering is known as submetering, and this can really help achieve this, as we'll see. And it all comes back to the old adage that if you want to manage, first you have to measure. And this can therefore be used to help identify um, 
high loads or when energy is being used but there is no activity and indeed you can also as a business manage your energy better to avoid peak demand transgressions which can result in high costs. It's widely accepted that by um, applying good practice um, energy savings of up to eight, at 30 percent can be achieved and even in, ex, ex, um, in it higher than this and using metering is a good way to identify where high energy use is so that it actually can be reduced and it's widely accepted um, that that is a, a, a genuine application of metering. So putting into place the use of meters considerable reductions are possible of energy and of course for businesses this can also mean carbon reduction, um, sustainability, um, a plan to work towards their net zero objectives as there is a target in the UK of net zero for 2050. The legislation around this also influences behaviour. Building regulations as we'll see is a huge um, contribution to the this movement towards metering and submetering, and for businesses it can be a great accreditation to show that they are working actively on reducing energy use, um, addressing their carbon emissions uh, under their sort of corporate social responsibility and environmental social governance objectives. So building regulations. These drive a lot of the practices around energy efficiency within new buildings and building upgrades and extensions. And as you can see here, a key part of this under the conservation of fuel and power, document L, we see section 5.8 refers to energy metering as, as a method to um, address the uh, uh, energy reduction up, um, ambitions. Further detail we can see in 5.17 of the building regulations, you'll see bit metering is, is mentioned a number of points here. So it's saying energy submetering should be installed in new buildings or when fixed building services are provided or extended in existing buildings. And it goes on to explain how and where metering should be applied. It says here that at least 90% of annual energy consumption should be designated and this is identified through the metering. Metering should enable comparison of forecast and um, energy so that reporting can be achieved and we'll come back to reporting later in this presentation. Metering should allow the energy use of different tenants within a building to be separately monitored and this can also um, fall under the scope of MID for billing. And renewable energies should be separately monitored so PV systems, wind um, and, and so on would also need monitoring and therefore metering. And what it also says is that if you've got a larger than 1000 meter square area you should also make the metering automatic and we'll see how that can be achieved throughout this presentation. Thankfully there is guidance, um, lots of information and I've put links in the annex of this presentation which we'll also send out following the training. Um, one example of that is um, a guidance document um, here which goes on to explain how metering can be applied across a building or a business's site. Another part of the building regulations talks about where you have CHP plant um, known as combined heat and power and here once again metering should be provided so yet another example of how it um, drives this behavior. Then we have BRIAM which is a building environmental performance assessment guidance um, and indeed metering is stipulated within BRIAM. Indeed Bargo is investing heavily in a new site in Rugby 
and we are going through this very process ourselves. So you can see that um, it's extensive reference to BRIAM is made by the UK government. And in fact, it's a necessity now that if you as a contractor wish to tender for any government, i.e. public sector developments, that you would have to ensure that your um, tender is including scope for the building to achieve the excellent rating. And indeed, to achieve an excellent rating, it stipulates that these systems, and it's an extensive list as you can see here, will all have to be submetered. So once again, it's driving the requirement for metering across these premises. Other UK legislation, in addition to the building regulations, and this I would have to say is for a business's accountant to have a good and solid knowledge of. I can only really touch the surface, but there are schemes in place that are there, such as ESOS, the Energy Savings Opportunity Scheme, that um, is driving increased energy efficiency. We're in phase three now, and it's a four yearly cycle. And as stated there, every four years, businesses have to have a plan to find new ways to save energy. The Streamlined Energy and Carbon Reporting um, Scheme, is, is another example of an of a incentive for businesses. Um, this one talks about mandatory greenhouse reporting, greenhouse gas reporting, and it, and it complements and works in parallel with ESOS. But once again, in order to report energy use and indeed energy savings, metering is highly um, contributory to obviously understanding where energy has been used and indeed where energy has been saved. In turn, these can form part of businesses' energy management programs, energy management plans, and reporting is a key part of that. Another area where businesses can participate is in accreditation schemes. Most people are familiar with ISO 9001, the quality um, assessment uh, scheme, but there is other ISO standards, including ISO 50001, which is an energy management program that businesses can uh, take advantage of, and then we would obviously be able to show a, a mark on their website that they are compliant and working to this standard, which in turn means as a business they may profit from other uh, businesses that want to work with other companies that are similarly engaged. And a key part of this, once again, is the importance of measuring results and to continually improve energy management. So very much like we saw previously, these are cyclic processes where continually energy savings should be achieved and to achieve that, you must be able to measure and monitor successes. So what about metering itself, types of meters? I guess we're all familiar with our own domestic meters. Um, you have the traditional electromechanical type and increasingly, and partly because of energy efficiency, we are being encouraged to take up smart meters whereby you can often see a visual display in your own property and this is once again around the notion that if you can see energy use you can perhaps be modify your behavior and, and reduce energy larger businesses larger energy users um, if certainly if they have a, an energy demand greater than 100,000 volt amps, have to have half hourly meters. And um, these are uh, 
able to obviously determine energy use in a much more granular way and it can influence um, billing costs for that business. General purpose industrial meters um, such as Vargo's own 2857 series. These predominantly are used for sort of process metering, energy management, or indeed, as we will discuss in a little more detail, submetering for the granular measurement of power across a building site. And indeed, the ones that we will focus on a little bit in more depth, meters that are referred to as MID meters require the um, certification, which we'll talk about briefly, to enable them to be used for billing. Um, obviously, if you're raising a bill, perhaps as a landlord to a tenant, it, it needs to be robust and secure and accurate so that any um, tenant is, you know, has the assurance that the bill is accurate. Obviously, when you look at meters, predominantly the most important metric, i.e. measured value, is the energy, which is an accumulative value in kilowatt hours. We, we know that as a in a domestic capacity as a unit of energy, which we are charged typically around 40 pence at the moment, or varies, of course, on your tariff. When you start looking at industrial meters used perhaps for submetering, they can record and display and also export values far more in far more different um, metrics such as voltage, current, frequency. And then we get into the sort of power qualitative um, measures such as reactive power, power factor. So these values can be seen both instantaneously, but also as a cumulative values, such as the kilowatt hours we've mentioned, but also the reactive power, um, which can lead to poor power factor and potentially penalties if you're a large energy user. So we've talked quite a lot about metering in the application of building regulations and legislation. There are several other purposes where metering is becoming more and more prevalent. So we see things like EV charging, renewables. We see even increasingly now you have businesses wanting to be able to measure the energy content of an item made. So you can establish that by measuring individual machines. And we even have OEM machine builders now specifying metering for this very purpose so that they can then establish an energy content per item made. And then we get to the notion of the tenant and landlord, which could be um, rental properties, um, maybe multiple occupancy properties, or things like um, maybe student uh, accommodation, or even things like airport and um, concessionaires like the duty free and, and the, the various outlets in, in such an establishment where the provider of the facilities will want to bill the individual tenants. So we can see how huge this market is. I have tried to research the size of the market, but because of the different types of meters, there is, doesn't appear to be one report that encompasses all, but it has to be a huge figure. And as we can see from the demand for meters, it clearly is these economic drivers that's growing the demand. So we just touched on billing and What's critical in a billing application is that the meter has certification for accuracy and other measures such as tamper-proof features. So MID literally stands for Measurement Instruments Directive and uh, that stipulates the criteria that the meter needs to uh, achieve and adhere to. 
um, what's very important is that you have visible evidence that the meter has MID approval. And so pre-Brexit, you saw simply CE marking the year of manufacture and the notified body that certified the meter, the certificate number. Post-Brexit, there is now also UK CA marking and a UK notified body certification. And as we can see, there are various methodologies that you can use in order to achieve the accreditation. Um, Fargo 879 meters are under the BD category uh, for quality assurance uh, during the manufacturing process. So to, we're using our own 879 meters as an example of typical MID approved meters that are typically employed as sub-metering or individual meters for perhaps landlord tenant arrangements. And so you can see that in our range here, we have direct metering. These are rated at up to 65 amps. And you'll see in a moment that the only reason there's two different types here is simply from a wiring configuration perspective. Notice the main power connections are all at the base here, whereas here they're in line. And a third type of meter that is for current transformers. And I'll come on to that. And here we see the specifications that we'll touch on in a little bit more detail as we go through. So a typical example of how these are installed. This is showing a three phase implementation, but they can equally be used on single phase just by connecting line one and neutral. And you see that you have the source of power, the three phases feeding into the meter and conversely back out again to the load. So directly measuring the power up to 65 amps. Um, the difference with this slightly different version of the meter is that the wiring is in this series approach versus a sort of parallel approach. So it's simply to lend itself to different installations and convenience of installation. You can also see that we've got connections for communications and also to choose to toggle through two different tariffs here. The third version of the meter is the version used with current transformers. The current transformers simply measure a large current by means of a ratio. So for example, 100 to 1 amp or 100 to 5 amps, right up to 2,500 amps to 1 or 5 amps. And the idea is that by using the current transformer, either what's called a fixed core or a split core that's easy to retrofit, you can handle these very high loads, but only by measuring one or five amps, which obviously means the instrument, the meter itself can be much more compact and in fact, quite easy to install on existing systems. So a little bit more on the Fargo 879 series. What we have is communications, which you'll re remember when used as sub-metering in some implementations, we need to be able to record and manage the, the results that the meters are capturing. So the export of that data is achieved in, under a number of methods, either a simple pulse output, where you typically get a pulse for every kilowatt hour that the meter records. Or if you want much more information, we can either use what's called MBUS, which is short for meter bus, or Modbus. Now, we, in the case of our meters, we have Modbus RTU, which is a serial method of connection, which means the meters can be positioned around a site at quite long distances from the central energy management system. Or we now also have an option to connect with 
Modbus TCP, which is an Ethernet based solution enabling individual IP addresses for each meter. We can also export very conveniently, which is actually quite a unique feature for the Vargo meter, using a Bluetooth connection and an app on either an Android or iOS device so that you can download meter readings. Now, if you were a tenant and had to take meter readings for, um, sorry, if you were a landlord and needed to take meter readings of tenants' bills, that could be very convenient and would also give evidence of where the meter reading was derived. The optional Modbus TCP unit simply snaps onto the side of the meter. So you have a one-to-one -one relationship of the IP address to individual meters. However, in some instances, it might be more convenient to use essentially a daisy chain approach whereby one Modbus TCP interface can actually interface to a number of meters, not just Vargo meters, but third party meters using Modbus RTU. There's a theoretical maximum of 31, but um, it's probably good practice to keep this to approximately half that figure because you can get latency issues and network traffic issues. We mentioned about um, collating data. So obviously if you're on a large site and you have a number of submeters positioned around the business to get this granular data, you can pull that back into a centralized system such as Vargo's energy data management, which is based on one of our standard controllers running a specific software that we provide under a license arrangement, which then enables you to create databases, dashboards of energy use, um, trends and such information. And if you recall, with the building regulations, in certain sizes of buildings, automatic meter reading and data collection is necessary. So this could lend itself to that function. So what do we typically get from a meter in terms of metrics? Well, in the case of the 879 MID, which has a large high resolution backlit display, most of your important information is available at a glance without having to enter any sort of sub menus or further um, navigation. So we have positive active energy in tariff one, because this can toggle between two tariffs quite easily. In fact, it has four tariffs, um, two of which are accessible through the communication means. So you have sort of positive energy in both tariffs, negative energy, which is essentially energy that's being um, perhaps uh, generated from PV and fed back into the mains rather than sourced from the mains. We have supply frequency. We have active power, that's real-time power in kilowatts. Active KVA, active KVAR, active current. And then we've got the energy, which is the accumulative value of kilowatt hours that's resettable, effectively referred to as a trip counter. So you could take effectively a meter reading by reading the value, resetting this trip, and then on the next meter read, you will know the difference between the first and second reading. Reactive energy, KVAR hours. And then what's known as the energy quadrant, whether it's active or reactive, consuming or exporting. And you've got the four quadrants there. And for the, finally, the power factor, which is if it's at one, that's a measure that you're, you have a good quality power. Some other benefits of the meters, you have Vargo cage clamp with levers for fast, reliable, and use with various cable conductor types. For the MID approval, there is a, a sealable cover to ensure tamper-free operation. 
And then as a summary of all of the benefits, there are numerous information here, including that dual tariff, which could be beneficial if you have what's known as an economy seven type tariff, where you have a day rate and a night rate, or perhaps if it's being used for EV charging, different types of vehicles that you wish to charge at different tariffs. As I say, two directly Togger can be configured or a further two via the field bus. And then we also have current transformers up to 750 amps for MID billing purposes. You can only use solid core CTs for billing, um, partly because they can't easily be removed, but also to get the accuracy of 0.5 class, which is what is specified it's only possible with a solid core. Customer types by application. Well, we can see that all of the main customer types we would typically interact with as either us as a manufacturer or yourselves as a wholesaler, distributor. It includes the end users and the consultants that specify solutions for buildings, as we've seen with the building regulations, OEMs that might be making machines which want to have their energy measured at source, installers or in, in, integrators, so-called um, system integrators will obviously be potentially implementing the metering, switchgear panel builders will obviously be purchasing metering, Installers will install, and then you have building contractors and facilities managers that are also very highly involved across these various requirements for metering. So just the last few slides, just give some links to where further information can be found. So when it comes to energy metering, energy data management, accessories like current transformers. Um, Varga has an extensive um, brochure uh, repository. There is numerous videos out as well. I did one myself on the whole purpose, just focusing of submetering itself. And we have one that covers the meters, energy data management, and of course, our homepage for metering on our website. As far as some of the references I've used, which are external to Vargo, third party, we've got the building regulations, the building energy metering application guide, Briam's website, the government Ministry of Justice property. Um, development standards. Um, the, the one that talks about public sector guidance and ISO 50001. So um, we've completed the main presentation. I can now open up for the next few minutes um, to any questions. Thanks, Andy. Um, it's really insightful. Uh, as you mentioned, it's now the Q&A time. Um, so if you have any questions or thoughts on the topic, then please do continue to pop them into the Q&A box. Uh, we've had a couple through already, so we'll go through okay. them now. Um, and then uh, if we come to time, uh, then we'll follow up the rest by email. Excellent. OK, okay. we'll happily do that. Uh, Brilliant. The first question um, is, does Bream overthrow part one? I think you know, they, they're effectively, from my understanding, it's they, they appear to be in tandem. You have the building regulations and then the, the Bream is, if you like, the backbone to the, in a sense, stipulates uh, a, a, an approach. That's how I understand it to be. I think they, they, they effectively are both 
important and both need to be observed. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's any follow ups to that, then. Um, yes, I'll, I'll happily um, feed any further questions my way and I can investigate and come back on that. Sure. Uh, another question Is there a requirement for any calibration on the MID accredited meter? Ah, uh, that's a very good question. I'm glad somebody asked that because I didn't actually include it in the presentation. I was keeping an eye on the clock and the number of slides. Um, yes, uh, a MID certified meter actually has a validity period of eight years from date of manufacture. In fact, if I quickly flick through the slides back to the page where I had that information, You'll notice why here there is in fact a manufacturing date. And presently you will see meters that are manufactured this year with an M24 indication. Yes, yeah, so from from that date, they have essentially an MID approval and calibration of eight years. Thank you. Uh, next one is the CT options for the 879. Is it to uh, 2500 amp on each phase? Yes, so um, if I remember which way to go on the slides, I can show you that again. Yes, here we are. Um, so yeah, so if it was just being used on a single phase, you'd have a single CT on L1 and neutral is just directly connected from the load to the supply with a tap off to the meter for voltage reference. So yes, a single CT on a single phase, on a three phase system, you'll see a CT on each phase. So the meter can report the current in each phase. And of course it can also report the power, which is you know, essentially a mathematical equation of the voltage times the current taken into account power factor as well, of course. Yeah. Um, and of course, the CTs can um, go up to 2,500 amps from Vargo if it's a solid core. Um, the split core, it's limited to a 1,000 amp rated. Um, but if you need it to be MID, which is a higher accuracy class of 0 0.5, then we have CTs up to 750 amps solid core available. Hopefully that answers that question. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions regarding the Vargo management package. Um, oh yes, yes. Is there yeah. a cost associated with it? Does it have a monthly subscription cost? Um, and are there any demos available? Um, well, we can take, uh, I mean, I hope that perhaps um, yourselves can um, capture the customer's inquiry on this one and we could follow that up in in, in a professional manner um, with obviously providing pricing, a demonstration at the customer's site if that's what they would like. It, essentially, it's, it's sold by a license per controller. So these controllers are a standard, what might be referred to as a PLC, which is a programmable logic controller, which when they initially supplied out the box have actually no function. They have to have a project, a program written that makes them do what they're intended for. They're very versatile. And one of the things they can do is act as an energy management system. So the software is already written you potentially purchase a license and we can obviously come back to you with pricing on that information and as well as the hardware costs. And then obviously you can collate all of the individual submeters um, centrally. And obviously it creates these um, analytics, the database of information and the reports that can be exported. It, it has, what's known as MQTT, which is message queuing, 
telemetry um, to take information over Ethernet up to cloud services, whether they're Vargo's or the customer's own or a third party, such as um, Microsoft Azure. So yes, please, please, um, can we capture any inquiries? And we delighted to follow those up. Yeah, uh, we have all the questions as well. So I will um, send them over to you as, as well as all the other details. Thank um, you very much. Some other ones, they are coming in uh, quite quickly. We've got a couple <laughs> of uh, What is the maximum size of cable that can be accommodated by the 879 cable clamp? Right, uh, that I can find out for you. If I check, uh, I can find it quickly. I might need to follow that up. Let me just see if I've got it to hand. I'm not sure if it actually mentioned it on the slide. Actually, no, I'm not showing it there. Let me see if I have it to hand quickly. Otherwise, we can post that answer back to the person making the question. Yeah, I'd have to check. Um, I'd have to check that for you. It's 65 amp rated, so obviously it would be commensurate with that. But I will come back to you with information on that. Sure. Okay. I'll keep a note. Um, yeah. Can the 879 clamps be used for three phase motors that cannot be turned off? Uh, they're looking at between 5 and 16 amp per phase. So um, effectively, if you're looking at this type of CT, um, then providing it's safe to work, sometimes there is quite strict legislation around you know, working on equipment that's operational. You know, I, I've been involved in the past in what they call safe, safe systems of work um, and permits to work. So providing those, requirements are met, then in principle, these can be snapped over a cable. As I say, the, the sort of health and safety and safe systems of work should be observed if that's going to be undertaken. But it doesn't disturb the existing cable. So in that respect, it's um, one point to consider though, of course, is that the CT is positioned around the individual conductor. So obviously if it was a three phase cable, where and which is typically three phases an earth, there's not, not always a neutral if it's a motor, but three phases at least in one a conductor with an ex external insulation around all three cables, then of course you can't individually select the correct phase for the CT. So that, that needs to be considered, but if they're, if they're accessible as individual phase conductors, then in principle, they can be snapped over the cable without disturbing the cable. But as I say, I would encourage people to check with, you know, safe systems of work processes. Mm. Okay. Um, Stan, there's, there's quite a lot of questions to go through. So as I oh, mentioned, well. <laughs> uh, we've only got about a minute left, but we okay. will well, we um, can follow take up. Any more and, yeah. uh, so um, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we do look forward to having you in our future webinars. If you do have any other questions or inquiries, um, I have captured them from those who have entered them into the Q&A box. But if you think of any more uh, later on, and please, please do send them over to marketing at rexcel.co.uk. Um, so that's marketing at rexcel.co.uk, um, and we'll do our best to reply to you. That's all for today. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much, Ian, and thank you for everybody that's participated. Thank you. Thank you.